Let's get the machinery working and the recording on. Uh, welcome back. There's a lot to get through here and I don't want to rush, so I'm going to move at a measured pace and it'll just take however much time it takes. Uh, but this is content that uh, I personally find deeply confusing and spent a decade or so trying to sort out in my mind. Uh, and so I'm sympathetic to the idea that it's got a natural pace to it and we let it unfold and we can't just rush through it. So let's continue then from what I didn't finish last week, <laughs> which was causal inference. Uh, we're not going to finish causal inference today either. No one will ever finish causal inference. Causal inference is an unsolved problem. Uh, Hume told us that, right? <laughs> uh, we're never going to solve causal inference. Uh, but you can cause, uh, solve causal inference by assumption. That is, if you can assume a DAG is true, then you can say a lot of really powerful and important things about when science can work. And that is a great, great achievement. And I'm trying to give you an introduction to that framework. So. I had gone through a number of examples last week of cases where confounding arises by conditioning on variables uh, or confounding is rather solved by conditioning on other variables. Um, and there is a framework that unites all these examples and it's called the backdoor criterion. If we want to make a causally valid inference about the effect of some treatment or exposure on an outcome then we need to shut all of the so-called backdoor paths into the uh, exposure. What does that mean? Well, if there are arrows entering, paths entering the back uh, of the variable. I'll give you some examples here. Um, so, uh, and, and since there are really only three different ways that variables can meet in a DAG, you learned them before, I'll remind you on the next slide what they are, and there's a specific way to open and close each of them by conditioning, you got all the tools you need. Uh, if you can assume the deck, right? So, uh, uh, and this is progress. It doesn't win Hume's war, but it does give us a lot. So to remind you here, what I call the four elemental confounds, really there's three here and then there's the descendant, which lurks in all of them, uh, right? And you have to beware the descendant, it's always there. So they are the fork in the upper left, the fork is, sort of the most basic thing that we're usually taught of as a confound. It's a common cause of two things that creates a spurious correlation between them. So Z is a common cause of X and Y. It generates a statistical correlation between X and Y unless you condition on Z. So this is a path. Information flows from X to Y until you close the fork. Uh, the metaphor breaks right there, right? No one's ever closed a fork. Break the fork. Yeah, that works better. Break the fork by conditioning on Z. Uh, the pipe. Uh, is a flow of causation with mediation by Z. So X and Y are correlated, not because X causes Y, but because X causes Z and Z causes Y. If you want to block the pipe, uh, you condition on Z. If you don't want to block the pipe, and sometimes you don't, then you don't condition on Z. And then finally the collider, my favorite. The collider is terrifying, <laughs> but powerful. Uh, the collider is when Z is a common result of X and Y. And then X and Y are not correlated with one another until you condition on Z. And then that opens the path and lets information flow between them. It's like the light switch. Remember the light switch? If the light is on and you know the electricity is working, then you know if the switch is on or not, right? That's what a collider does. And then the descendant is lurking in all of these. If there's something like A in this graph here, that is a descendant of any variable, then if you condition on the descendant, it's like weakly conditioning on the variable itself because A has information about Z. And so if you condition on A, you're partially blocking the path there. Does that make sense? So conditioning on a descendant of a collider is like conditioning on a collider, just a little weaker, depending upon how strongly correlated the descendant is uh, with its parent. So let me give you some examples now. Uh, we're going to want to assemble these things together into bigger causal frameworks. And any DAG, no matter how big, is just made up of those four things. That's all that's possible in a DAG. There's nothing else you can do by the logic of DAGs. Now, nature can do other stuff, but we're not going to talk about nature right now. We're just talking about DAGs, OK? Uh, that's enough to understand. So let me give you just the most basic kind of confound, the classic confound. Uh, we've got some exposure, E, like say education. E is for education and some outcome, W, wages, right? Why do people go to school? Well, I went to school because I wanted to learn how the universe worked, but most people go to school to make more money, 
right? Because they're rational. <laughs> and uh, so a lot of research effort is put into figuring out what the returns on education are. And uh, so we're interested in this direct path. What's the causal influence of education, completed education on wages? But there are a lot of confounds, unobserved confounds, you, that mean that a simple regression can't tell you that. Yeah, this is the basic confound. What kinds of confounds? Neighborhoods, family environment, uh, personality characteristics that have nothing to do. So if you're, if you're a determined and hardworking person, you're more likely to finish school and you're going to make more money. Right? But it has nothing to do with the education. Yeah, and likewise, if you're super lazy, you're less likely to finish school and you're less likely to make money, but it has nothing to do with the education effect. It's just a common confound. Uh, those sorts of things lurk in all of this. So, to, uh, in this, to, how do we deconfound uh, this DAG using the backdoor criterion? I want you to see is there are two paths from E to W in this graph. The first is the direct path, the one that we're interested in estimating from E to W. That's the front door <laughs> from education. I'm sorry, this is not my terminology. If you don't like it, blame you to Pearl. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and then there's the other one from E to U to W, and that's the backdoor path, right? Because it enters the back of education. And notice the thing about these paths is you can walk against the arrows. Information will walk against the arrows, no problem, right? <laughs> the arrows are about causation. They're not about statistical information flow. And that's where confounding comes from. It comes from the fact that information flows in a Bayesian network against arrows and with arrows, but causation in the real world only flows with the arrows, and we want to know the direction of the arrows. Does that make some sense? Uh, so these backdoor paths, um, you can walk against the arrows, they're still paths. So how do we shut uh, uh, path number two? Well, look at path number two and tell me what kind of path is that? It's not a rhetorical question. I want some audience participation. Somebody know? Hmm? That's not the collider, no, but thank you for participating. <laughs> it's, the, it's the fork, it's the opposite of the collider, right? It goes the other way, it's like, eh, eh, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, this is the fork, and how do you close a fork? Condition on you. You condition on you, which is unobserved, <laughs> right? So we can't condition on it here, we're screwed. Yeah, we need some other. So uh, this is a sad story. Right now we need the sad trombone sound. If anyone can make one, wah, wah, or whatever, right there. But this is, this is a good thing that a dad can tell you is that you cannot, unless, um, in this design, if this is the true causal uh, network, you cannot get an unbiased, unconfounded estimate of the effect of education on wages unless you can measure the confound. And that's important, right? That would end a bunch of newspaper articles right there. Right. Imagine like the second line of a newspaper card was a new study of da da da. Unfortunately, it's hopelessly confounded and cannot possibly give us a legitimate estimate of the causal influence. End of article. Right. <laughs> Lots of scientific articles would end right there, uh, and that's an achievement. We'd waste uh, less time. Uh, but you can think of it as a scientific program. You realize this, and then you set out to measure those confounds. Right. But if if the graph tells you you have to do that, then you find a way to do it. There's another way to solve this problem that I'll teach you later in the course. It's called an instrumental variable. Uh, but we're gonna need more statistical tools before I can tell you what that is. And it's not the backdoor criterion isn't what solves it. It's something else it's called do calculus, which sounds even weirder. <laughs> but, um, okay, here's an example that I uh, terrified you with last week, right? Or thrilled you with, I should say. You weren't terrified, you were thrilled. It's like a roller coaster, yeah. And uh, this is the grandparents, parents and grandchild um, effects of education example where we have a neighborhood common neighborhood confound between parents and their kids if we want to estimate the direct causal influence of grandparents on their kids that is um, we should note that there are three paths from grandparents to kids in this graph there's the direct path there's the path through parents and there's the path through parents and neighborhoods you see that? You can trace it with your eyes. Yeah, you get good at this. You start doing this with graphs. There, sometimes there's lots of paths. Yeah, your computer can find all the paths very quickly for you. In the, in the notes, I uh, tell you about an R package called Daggity, which will automate this for you, and I'll give you some examples of how to do it. So now here's the thing. If we condition on P, that closes the second path, which is what we'd want to do, right? If we want the direct effect of grandparents on grandkids, we want to close the path through parents. Parents are a confound. 
And so since that's a pipe, right, there's a pipe going from grandparents to grandkids, you close the pipe by conditioning on parents. But that opens the other path. When you condition on parents, parents are a collider on the other path, on path three. They're a collider between grandparents and the unobserved neighborhood effects. That path was closed until you cleverly conditioned on parents, and now it's open. So you're ruined one way or the other in this graph. And again, there is no way to get a valid causal inference unless we can measure the neighborhood effects or use an instrument or something like that. This is an achievement. This is not, uh, this, this is happy news because we know we were being fooled, right? Formerly we were, we were fooled and we were uh, recommending the wrong policy intervention because we were confounded and overconfident. This is an achievement to calibrate ourselves on what nature is actually like. Richard? Yes, Brett. Could you explain why three is closed before you've conditioned on three? Because there's a collider along the path. Colliders are closed unless you condition on them. Information doesn't flow until you condition on the collider. Pipes are open, forks are open until you condition. Colliders are closed until you condition. Yeah, so there's a, it's, it's the two arrows entering P means that nothing flows there. It gets stuck uh, unless you condition on P and then information flows happily <coughs> through and you're confounded again. Does it make sense? Yeah? Yeah, a little bit, okay. It's like the light switch thing, right? It's, there's no statistical association. You can't learn anything about the electricity uh, uh, by knowing the switch unless you know if the light is on. Right, so the light turns on only if the switch is on and the electricity is running. Uh, you get no information about the electricity by knowing the switch is on until I tell you the light is on or not. That's conditioning on the light, finding out about the light. So that's like here, parents are like the light. When you know the state of the parents and you know one side of the collider, you get information about the other side. And that's why it opens the path. It lets information flow through. Does that help? This takes, again, I told you, I've been a decade fighting with myself and feeling miserable for not understanding things in this literature. So uh, don't beat yourself up if, if something's confusing. As I keep saying, if you're feeling confused, it's because you're paying attention. And I thank you for your attention. OK, something more fun. Let's build these up. As I, I, I told you, any graph of any size is just composed of these little elemental confounds glued together into terrifyingly large and wonderful natural structures. Yeah, and uh, here's a fun one. Uh, this graph can produce lots of fun things. What is going on here? So we've got some exposure X and some outcome Y of interest. We want to know the causal effect of X on Y, the blue path in this graph. But there's lots of other things going on in confounds. Not only do we have confounds, but we have confounds with confounds. Yeah, this is nature. This is why, you know, we're all enraptured by it, <laughs> right? And uh, so we've got an unobserved um, cause of X on the left, uh, and then we have three measured variables, A, B, and C, that are covariates. So imagine you had given this data set, and you've got a column for X and a column for Y and columns A, B, C. And then your supervisor tells you to run some regressions and tell, you what, tell me what's going on. Uh, in the absence of the causal graph, it's terror here. I mean, you just throw them all in the multiple regression and report some confusing coefficients is what most people do. And journals are full of papers like that. Yeah, you can hold, do a whole productive career that way. Here I'm giving you the graph and I'm saying, what do you need to condition on actually? And what should you absolutely not condition on? Uh, and so I'll let you think about it for a moment. Let's think about it then. The backdoor criteria, criterion is, is sufficient to figure it out in this case. Uh, what's the procedure? You find all the paths from X to Y. And then for each of them, you figure out whether you need to open it or close it. Right. So before I turn to the next slide and reveal paths for you, maybe you can see what they are. How many paths are there from X to Y in this graph? I gave you one for free. It's blue. <coughs> there are three. Exactly. You guys are good. So there, there it is. There's three. There's only three. Right. You can go direct X to Y. And then you go up to U and then over A and then down again. Or you go up to U and down to B and down again. So it's three paths. Yeah? So what do we need to condition on? Um, condition on either A or C. You could condition on both, but that's redundant. Uh, you just need either A or C and nothing else. If you condition on B, everything is ruined. Because it's a collider. <coughs> and that path is closed already until you include B in your regression. 
So this is why I, I've been annoyingly echoing over and over again. It's like you don't just want to add things. This kind of causal salad approach where people just say, and then we controlled for a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff. So, oh, oh that, that's reassuring. <laughs> that's great because that generates confounds as often as it removes them. Uh, you have to be very careful, especially you, you've got the, the covariates themselves uh, flow into one another in any, any interesting system. And so you just throw them all in the model. Now you've got colliders of colliders. Who knows what's going on, right? You need to think very carefully about how this works. Uh, yeah. If you condition on C, does it make it like conditioning on B? Because C goes back to the point. No, the path, the path through B is closed. You can't go through B because it's a collider. Unless you put the information about B in the model, then information will flow through. Because if you if you know C and you condition on B, you get information about U even though you haven't measured it. <laughs> and then you get information about C. So it flows all the way through. But is it exactly equivalent, A or C? Or maybe A is better? Um, in, a, in the empirical details of a system, so the question was, is there any, I think if I understand your question, is there any reason to prefer A over C? Uh, are they completely symmetrical here? In this purely heuristic view where we're not worrying about things like measurement error, uh, a batch of stuff that I call residual confounding, they're equivalent and it won't matter. In reality, it, it'll nearly always matter because one of them might be measured more precisely than the other. And then, it, then you pick the one that's measured better. <laughs> yeah, but you may not know that. Uh, but in, in the reality, this is true. I mean, th that's, it's a good prompt for me to, to say something that I want to say over and over again as we keep going through the course, is that this causal inference business is useless without a sufficiently robust estimation procedure. You, there's these two cooperating halves of this business. You've got to be good at actually getting the information out of the data and respecting measurement, and you've got to have a causal framework that you're thinking with. And either alone is not sufficient. Right? They're both necessary. And uh, the estimation stuff is sometimes really important. Like when we get to instrumental variables, you've got to do that right. <laughs> and that's no joke, which is why it's in the second half of the course. Right? We're going to use Markov chains and, and a multivariate distribution to do it, and it's going to work. It'll be like magic. You'll be amazed. But... You know, about 50 years of statistical research were required to produce the model I will show you. <laughs> so it's no joke. This is no joke either, uh, but we put them together and we get a lot. They enhance one another a lot. Brett, is that a hand or a scratch? Could you condition yeah. on you to get the same kind of closure? If we had it, yes. If, if we could measure you, we could condition on you. Ah, okay. But we haven't. I'll, I'll keep using you means we haven't measured it. Unobserved. <laughs> Laurie. What happens if we condition on both B and C? On both? B and C. Uh, both B and C. Yeah. Uh, well, then, if you condition on C, you block that path. So you block it. Yeah, you can block it. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Waffles. You remember waffles? Waffle House. Beginning of last week. Yeah. Okay. Does everybody want waffles now? Um, Should have brought my waffle iron in. Actually, could have made waffles. Uh, so it's true. There's statistical correlation between uh, waffle houses per capita and divorce rate in the United States. Uh, state by state. Uh, I showed you that beginning of last week. Uh, let me assert a causal network here, which is not totally silly about how the variables we've seen uh, for the divorce example connect to one another. And then ask you, what do we need to control for to remove the spurious correlation between waffle houses and divorce? Or rather, to, to estimate the true causal impact of waffles on divorce. Yeah. Uh, what would it be? So let me explain this graph to you uh, very quickly. This is the same elemental confounds we've seen before. Um, at the uh, far right here, we've got W to D. That's the uh, path of interest. We want to estimate any direct causal effect of waffles on divorce. Uh, there's a back door into waffle houses from being in the South. How does being in the South cause Waffle House? Well, because Waffle House was started in the South as a Southern business, and it mainly stays in the Southern states. Um, it's never gone across the Mississippi, I don't think. Now, there's a few on the west of the Mississippi, just not very many. Uh, being in the south is correlated with lots of other things as well. And so there are other arrows coming out of the south. Uh, notice that this is where the science comes in. If you know about the variables, there aren't arrows entering south, right? Marriage doesn't cause a, a state to be in the south. But because you know what the variable is, it's a geographic location, you, you get information about causation from that. It gives you meaning. You do this all the time when you do statistics, of course. It's just this is a way to formalize that knowledge. Um, so we get causal arrows coming out of the South into agent marriage. There's, there's pressure, normative pressure in Southern states, having lived there myself, uh, to get married at a young age rather than shacking up. 
Uh, it's, that is, that's what it's called. It's called shacking up. When you live with your partner when you're not married in the South. It's, it's lots of places where that's not approved of. And so that's pressure to get married at an earlier age. Um, uh, there may be a direct effect of, on the South on marriage rates itself uh, because it's a valued institution. Um, and then I argued in the lesson last week that there's a plausible causal effect of agent marriage on marriage rate because if there are more young people and people get married more when they're young, then that'll increase the aggregate marriage rate just as a side effect right, of it. Um, and finally, there may be direct effects of agent marriage or marriage rate on divorce. And that bottom triangle is the thing we studied last week. Remember that, the classic confound? And we saw that conditioning on marriage rate, uh, conditioning on age and marriage showed that marriage rate ha has no plausible direct impact uh, on divorce, or at least not much. So I ask you, what do we have to do in this graph to estimate the causal impact of waffles? Or S. <laughs> yeah, so there are multiple answers. You could do A and M. You'd have to do both because there's a, there are a lot of paths. What are the paths? How many paths are there? Well, all of them start with W and we go backwards. It's backdoor pass. Remember, we come out the back door of Waffle House, <laughs> right? And, uh, this is where the metaphor pays off, right? And we, if we go to south, and then we can go straight down to A and then over to D. We could go over to S and then to M and then to D. We can go to S to A to M to D, right? All these paths. It is sufficient to condition on S, and it will close all of them. You could condition on A and M, too. That'll do the same job. But or you could just condition on S. So it would be sufficient just to have a very simple regression here where you just put the location of the state in the model. And that should, if this graph is right, remove the whole spurious effect and tell you if there is any direct causal impact of Waffle House on divorce. I leave it to you and your own fun at home to do this with the data set and see what happens. Yeah, Brett. Sorry, I'm asking a lot of questions. No, you're not. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> is this legit? You can say there's a valid path here. You start at W, you go to S, you go to M, you go to A, you go to D. Yeah, that's a valid path. Okay, but, but it's blocked by a collider. Because you've got two arrows going in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a collider there, right. Okay. But if you conditioned on that collider, you could open it. Yeah. But that's why you do it on A2. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Huh. Um, so you just said you just can close A and M, right? And it would be sufficient. But that would, that would still leave S in the game, right? Because but then it wouldn't suffice to find out the, um, the fact between waffle and divorce because it still doesn't um, um, do the backdoor criteria sufficiently, right? If you just <coughs> No, I think it closes all the back doors. I think so. Does well, it? you then have, like, if you have S, W, and T left, right? You just, it's like it's still you have still south in there, right? It's so it's the in the graph, but the paths the paths all the paths coming out of S will be blocked, mm -hmm. okay. right? You can't flow <laughs> through. Is it's, A open though because you conditioned on it? Uh, a is a pipe, so if you condition on it, you close it. A is in the middle of a pipe. Yes, yeah, right. you with me? Yeah. But if you're not close, the room goes south. Basically, then basically Waffle House is just a mediator. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In this graph, Waffle House is always a mediator for South. Yeah. That, that's okay, though. It still has a causal okay. impact. Okay. Right? Mediators cause things. Okay, yeah, no, yeah. I just thought you, you meant like you just want the effect of Waffle House. Yeah, yeah, and, and conditioning on A and M should do it, and conditioning on S should do it. Yeah. Make sense? This is fun. You, you should have fun at home. Just draw up a crazy dag, and then it's like a party game, right? Have your friends draw a dag for you, and then you have to tell you all the backdoor pass. Yeah, if you're drunk, it'll be better. Yeah. <laughs> Approaches I'm more familiar with. One would typically just go to which variables which you know are collinear with each other. And then. Really that's madness. Yeah, that's madness. Yeah. You should never do that. Uh, and I know that's taught uh, in this building, and you should never do it. <laughs> it, it, has no, it has no statistical legitimacy. That's all I'll say about that. Would you like to elaborate <laughs> a bit more in this case, for example? One would just explore the collinearity between these variables. And then how, so how do you select? The collinearity arises from the causal graph. Yeah, true. So you can't read it raw. It's the, it's, it's the independences, the conditional independences that matter. 
there, there is no logical framework in which looking at the collinearity between par paralyzed collinearity between variables tells you anything interesting about causation. Uh, that's just a fact. And this, I think this framework will tell you how to deduce that. If you buy this, uh, that's true. And I know that's been taught. You should forget you ever learned that and never do it. And if you see it in a paper, you should tell the editor that it should not be done. Fred. So what we're studying here effectively is how the South is influencing divorce through Waffle Houses. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I, would you say that again? Because it, it was grammatical, but yet it sounds crazy. So <laughs> no, if you but, condition of A and M, yeah. you block the path the South can influence divorce through anything but Waffle Houses in our model, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. that means that the relationship yes. between W and S now represents, it's like the, the fungus treatment. Right? Yes. It's the way the, the Being in the South is like a treatment mm -hmm. uh, that produces Waffle Houses. Well, no, I mean, the, there's a lot more causal steps in between, but that's, that's basically true. There was this economic development story, and Waffle Houses are independently owned businesses that buy licenses and all this other stuff, sure. Uh, but they're confined within the South right. almost and the entirely. It works is because Waffle Houses are a proxy for Southiness. Yes, for right. Southiness. And that's why you pick up the relationship. Exactly. But what if somebody wanted to actually study the effects of Waffle Houses on the presumption that you know there's, a, there's, a, there's an influence from the South and then separate from that, we want to get at how the, the over and above the Southiness, the Waffle Houses influence divorce. Is that something that comes immediately from the causal graph? Uh, well, after you condition on South here, right, you block all these other paths, if you get a live coefficient out of Waffle Houses, that should address that, right? right. But doesn't that imply that we, if we condition on A and N instead, we're measuring something different? I don't follow that. Uh, do we get different? Are we studying different things depending on how we condition the S versus the A and the M? If 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 this is the only absent some residual confounding assumptions, no. Uh, there's just this graph, and you're just blocking paths. Uh, when we we'll talk about measurement error and other interesting kinds of residual confounding later in the course, and then maybe we can loop back to this and talk okay. about it. I think in reality, yeah, you, you can end up studying different stuff. But given this graph, no, you're just blocking paths and paths are blocked and that's it. Um, and then we tell stories absolutely about Southiness. Uh, <laughs> having gone to college in the South, I know all about Southiness. Um, I was dabbing before anybody knew what it was, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't think people dab anymore. Do they? <laughs> well, that was a thing in Atlanta when I was going to college in Atlanta. Freak Nick and dabbing. Um, okay. So, uh, I want to get to overfitting today. <laughs> so, uh, good news, there's this great, there are a number of packages, both in R and other, other programs, you, you give them the DAG, uh, you just write the arrow network in, there are examples of this in, in the chapter, and then you can have it algorithmically tell you things about the graph. And one of the things you might want to do with these graphs is you shouldn't trust them. Uh, you can test your DAG. You don't have to accept it blindly, like it, it's a religious edict. Uh, and the way you test a DAG is you inspect the implied conditional independencies. That is, the structure of, of a causal network implies that some variables are independent of others after you condition on other variables. And this is just a logical thing. You can ask for any DAG. Your, your computer can spit out all the implied conditional independencies, and then you can test them using regressions. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if you want to test this DAG, what are the implied conditional independencies? Um, first, uh, so this is how you do it, uh, this package Daggity. And, uh, the full code for this, including specifying the DAG, is in the chapter. Uh, A is independent or D-separated. Um, D in D-separated, the D and D-separated means dependency separated. It's, it's a really awkward way to say independent, right? Uh, but <laughs> this is what it says in the papers in this literature. So A and W are D-separated conditional on S. So A and W, there'll be, there should be no correlation between agent marriage and Waffle Houses after conditioning <laughs> on the South. Right? You can see that in the graph, right? You block that path. Uh, it's a fork, right? A fork from South. Uh, D should be independent of S after you condition on everything else. Right? This is a hard one, uh, but that's a prediction of if this DAG is true, that should be true in your data. Uh, and then finally, um, M should be independent of W, that is marriage rate should be independent of Waffle Houses after you condition on the South. This is like uh, the first one, the top one. You block those paths. So you can test these and see if they're true. And I encourage you to give this a go. 
uh, with the Waffle House data set and play around with it. Um, parts of the DAG might be wrong, right? If one of these is wrong, it doesn't mean the whole thing is wrong. You just have to think and you have to use science. And this is a good lesson that the answers require data, but the answers aren't only in the data, right? The answers are also in the metadata and the things that we know about the variables and the causal background that gives us the motivation to study the phenomenon in the first place. Um, so this brings me, uh, I want to summarize uh, this part of, of the material. Uh, the good news is causal inference is hard, but possible, right? So there was this uh, Scottish fellow, David Hume, uh, preserved here in bronze with his very shiny toe. You can go touch his toe. If you haven't done the visit yet, you should go touch his toe. And uh, his toe is worn because people touch it all the time. And uh, definitely go touch his toe. Uh, take a journey and touch his toe. So Hume, I would say, did more to sort out causal inference than any, uh, any other thinker. Uh, and, and his major contribution was to say, look, correlation is not enough. And lots of philosophers thought it was. If you experience is enough, and his his lesson was no experience is not enough. You have to make assumptions to make causal inference, and there's no way out of that. And the whole approach to causal inference afterwards has been the Humean view of things. We haven't really solved Hume's problem here, but I think Hume would be pleased <laughs> with what we built because we've taken this to a, a really elaborate logical extreme, uh, so that we can be disciplined about what we do. Uh, given a DAG, you can demonstrate whether a study is capable of making a causal inference, and that's a huge victory. Uh, also, what I'm really excited about is it shows that experiments are not necessary to do causal inference. Experiments are great. What do experiments do? Experiments close all the backdoor paths by setting a variable's values. You play God and you set them, and that closes all the backdoor paths because you remove all the causes on that variable. Right? You're the only cause on that variable in an experiment, a good experiment. Right? A bad experiment, eh, lots of experiments are bad, and we'll talk about that when we do instrumental variables. Most experiments are actually like instrumental variable problems. But because um, your treatment is, is only correlated with the actual treatment, right? you have this intent to treat is the thing that happens. Uh, uh, but we don't need experiments if we can use the backdoor criterion and other tools of do calculus uh, to figure out when causal inferences um, are legitimate. And this is great because some things, especially in the human sciences, cannot be done experimentally. They're either impractical or unethical or both. Yeah, I think I study human evolution and most of the questions I want answers to cannot be studied experimentally. Absolutely cannot. So if experiments are necessary, we're done, we should shutter the institute and move on, <laughs> right? But we, we know that lots of progress can, can come from observational studies, but we can be more disciplined about it. Um, so, uh, uh, also the thing about experiments is you have to choose an actual intervention in an experiment. And this is a drawback as opposed to an observational study. So, uh, why? Because interventions change a lot of variables. They don't just change your target variable. They change a number of things. So, I ask you to imagine, for example, trying to experimentally manipulate obesity. You can't do it directly. You can't, there's not a lever on a person that lets you adjust their body weight. You have to do it through some change in exercise or diet, and which of those you choose will have different causal effects on other things in their lives. You won't be studying obesity, you'll be studying the network of effects that ripple out from the intervention you chose. Yeah, and that's true of all experiments. In an observational study, though, you can study obesity directly if you can close the backdoor pass through other things like activity. Yeah, does that make sense? This is a huge advantage of observational studies uh, compared to experiments. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot more than just the backdoor criterion, and later on in the course I'll give you an example of two things which are part of this framework of thinking about causal inference, but you, they don't rely upon closing paths, they rely upon stuff I'll explain later, <laughs> uh, exploiting covariance structures. And um, the first is called the front door criterion, this is a case where we use the existence of a mediator to remove a, remove a confound between the exposure and the outcome. I know psychologists have probably seen this before, right? It's called the front door criterion in this literature. Uh, and the other is instrumental variables, which are super popular in both um, behavior genetics uh, and in economics. And um, I'll show you how to use these as well. And uh, I'll just leave them as mysterious, weird diagrams for the moment, like hieroglyphics. But I'll show you how to use these. Uh, and again, lots of assumption is needed, uh, but you can break on through uh, to the other side. All right. That was a long walk to that point. Right, but I got there. <laughs> so, um, all right, uh, you shouldn't be overconfident. Um, I'm going to move quickly through this. There's a section in the chapter where I, I 
uh, recite all of these cautions as well. You shouldn't get cocky. Assumptions still necessary. DAGs are models. They're heuristic models. And then there's all this residual confounding stuff we'll talk about later on, like misclassification. What if you classify the outcomes wrong? Right? So this is the kind of measurement error. Measurement error is always there. Uh, you can put measurement error and an extreme form of measurement error is missing values. Uh, you can put these into a DAG. So we'll, we'll get there near the end. I'm going to show you how to run measurement error models and get that in. Uh, this is important. If, like me, you're an anthropologist, uh, the record is devastated and measurement error is just part of your life. Half of your measurement is error. <laughs> right, think about a carbon date. Anybody, or archaeologists in the audience? Right, so radiocarbon profile, it's like all error. <laughs> so uh, you've got to deal with this and be responsible. But phylogenetic trees, what is that? It's a big nest of error. And uh, you just have to deal with these things and be honest about it. But we can get that information, about that uncertainty, into the model. That's residual confounding. Um, and uh, uh, last thing I want to say, uh, you shouldn't let DAG stop you from making a real model. If you had a real model, you wouldn't need a DAG. What's a real model? It's a real causal model, nonlinear dynamic system model. So like physicists don't need DAGs. Why? Because they got real models, right? People who do pharmacokinetics don't need DAGs. Why? Because they have real models of the system. Uh, and they get ca those models have causal implications. They're not just multiple regressions. And they use those models as statistical models as well. And that's where we should be driving towards, right? So like if you're an astronomer, you don't need a DAG. <laughs> right? You've got a real model of the system to make predictions with. Uh, and that's, a, that's what you want to drive towards and push yourself past this uh, dependency on the heuristic thing. Okay, and with that, let me talk about astronomy. All right, so I think I have, I have 30 minutes to uh, give you the intro uh, to overfitting, which is a companion uh, set of problems to causal inference. So this is uh, uh, Nicholas Copernicus, uh, who was a Polish astronomer and lawyer, I believe, and ecclesiastical lawyer, if I remember the history right, uh, the best kind of lawyer. <laughs> and uh, uh, he's very well known, of course, for arguing for the idea that the sun lies at the center of the solar system. Um, and then, you know, there's this whole heroic story of a revolution in, in understanding and overturning of the Catholic Church's views on things. And Galileo had this fight with them, but that was long after this, right? So Copernicus publishes a book, dies, uh, the much later, Galileo has a big fight with the church over it. It comes much later. Uh, what's missing usually when this story is told is that Copernicus's model was terrible, just really awful, uh, no better than the Ptolemaic model. They made exactly the same predictions. They were using the same data, and they made exactly the same predictions, and they used exactly the same Fourier series approximation system. Copernicus used circular orbits. Uh, it, it was only Kepler later who, just, who realizes, oh wait, orbits aren't circular. We can solve the whole problem if we just allow, allow ellipses. Uh, but that comes much later. Copernicus is still thinks like, ah, uh, circles, the music of the spheres. Right? There's going to be these circles out there in space. And if you're committed to circles, you can't make the solar system work unless you start stacking circles on circles. And so Copernicus had epicycles too. Uh, this part is left out because it makes it a lot less romantic, right? <laughs> Think about it this way. This was not a huge victory. It was a, an equivalent model in terms of predictive accuracy, but with the sun at the middle instead of the earth. And so people are like, yeah, big deal, <laughs> right? Uh, you're going to make me fight with the church over a model that just makes the same predictions? No, thank you, right? Now, of course, this is an achievement still to show that you've got equivalent systems. Um, there is a way in which these models are different, however, uh, even though they make the same predictions. The Copernican model doesn't need, need as many circles. I forget how many fewer, but slightly fewer. Uh, you need more epicycles in the Ptolemaic model than you do in the Copernican model. It's simpler. And this is one of the things that Copernicus argued for in his book. He says, yeah, it makes the same predictions, but it's simpler, and therefore it is more beautiful. <laughs> right? There's this, this argument that, that simpler things are more likely to be correct. And scientists will often invoke this thing called Occam's razor, uh, named after an eccentric monk, uh, William of Ockham. Um, and uh, uh, having done you know, a, a full 10 minutes of research on this, all I could ever find uh, for a quote for this was somebody else saying that he said this thing, in Latin, of course, because that's what monks spoke, <laughs> um, that plurality should never be posited without necessity. Uh, this is not really a fully developed scientific research program. <laughs> um, and people invoke it heuristically. We need something more statistically substantial if we're going to really decide between models based upon their complexity. Uh, and I don't think uh, uh, 
the focus on simplicity alone is really sufficient. Usually when we're uh, comparing models, we have to make trade-offs between complexity and accuracy. Uh, the, the Copernican case is misleading because you've got two models which are uh, in their predictive accuracy the same, or they're fit, so they're the same. They fit the solar system, the data we have at hand exactly the same, but one's simpler than the other. Usually that's not what we're deciding between. We're deciding between models which are more complicated but make better predictions, uh, hopefully, they fit the data better, and models which are less complicated but fit the data worse. That's usually what we're trading off in science. And so Occam's uh, principle is incomplete. It's only one side of this. Prefer simplicity, but what about the accuracy part? Don't we care about that too? Uh, how much loss of accuracy should I be willing to tolerate for a unit of simplicity, William? Right, and William's long dead, so he will not tell us. Uh, so let me tell you another allegory. I want you to think about the voyages of Ulysses. Sorry, I was a classics minor, and so there's all this stuff polluting my head from having taken years of Latin and Greek and read about stories about monsters and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, Ulysses probably needs no introduction. Uh, so let's just get to the point in his journey where he uh, fights a monster in a whirlpool. So he gets near Sicily over here at some point, and there's this monster, uh, two monsters, Scylla and Charybdis, that eat most of his crew, <laughs> I think the story goes. And um, here it is, pictured, right? And uh, uh, so, we have on the left, that's Charybdis, the whirlpool of Charybdis, which sucks ships down to their certain doom. You have to avoid that when you're, you're sailing between this narrow strait. And then there's the many-headed monster, Scylla, uh, on the rocks, which gobbles up sailors. You can see some sailors taking a wild ride uh, right there, uh, number two. And I want to use this as a, admittedly silly, but hopefully it'll stick in your memory, metaphor for how complexity and accuracy trade off. Uh, there are monsters on both sides. Uh, and they have different properties to them. And we can characterize these properties. And we want to choose models which manage to navigate between these two monsters. But the monsters are always there. Uh, information theory requires that they will be present. Uh, before I get into the details of that, I want to say, in the wilds of the sciences, uh, uh, the kind of standard method for choosing which variables you'll include in regression is something that I want to call stargazing. Uh, it's called stargazing because you run a regression and then you pick out the asterisks and you keep the, you keep the coefficients. You want to model where everything is significant, right? And uh, uh, you should never do this again. <laughs> you should not do this. There is nothing about p-values. Now, you know I don't like p-values anyway because they don't answer a question that I think is relevant. Uh, but whether you, you use them or not, the design of p-values is not to solve this problem. This is not what they're designed to do and the, so they do a bad job at it. Right? If you were going to choose a model that made good predictions, it will often include terms that are not significant. And a model that makes good predictions will sometimes exclude significant terms as well. The statistical significance is not a criterion about explained uh, predictions. It's just not what it's about. It's about controlling type 1 error rate, and that's it. It's not about predictive accuracy. So, uh, and I should, probably shouldn't have to say, but I will, 5% is arbitrary. An arbitrary 5% is arbitrary. It's like, a, it's like a scientific superstition that we care about 5%, right? It's, it's bizarre. It just has to be because certain bony fishes had five uh, cartilaginous rays in their fins, and they got up on the land, they started walking, and they turned into people. And so it's this, you know, five thing. <laughs> uh, that's the only reason. Uh, and I know it's, it's bizarre, but it's true. And if, if aliens ever colonize the Earth and save us, they will say, this goes, right? <laughs> the bony fishes. The tyranny of the tetrapoda, I call it in the text. Um, so don't stargaze, please. Uh, OK, what are our goals? For the rest of this week, I want to help you understand these two monsters. Uh, they're not actually called Scylla and Charybdis. They're called overfitting and underfitting. And they, are, they always happen in statistics, and you have to worry about them. I want to introduce you to a phenomenon called regularization, which is the procedure of teaching statistical models to expect overfitting and guard against it. This is something that's done in machine learning nearly always and done in the sciences only rarely. But we should do it more. Uh, Cross-validation and information criteria are tools you can use to cope with overfitting. They don't solve it, but they measure it. Uh, they help you estimate predictive accuracy out of sample. They estimate the overfitting risk of a model. Uh, and they help us understand the relationship between model complexity and uh, the monsters. Uh, on the cliff. Uh, and I want to emphasize throughout all this material that finding a model that makes good predictions is actually a different task than finding a model that gives you valid causal inferences. 
You can have a nonsense model that makes really good predictions. But it, if you then decide to do an intervention designed upon your understanding of it, you'll be in big trouble. So think about like how Netflix predicts your viewing habits, right? So they've got, uh, you may have heard about these competitions, right? Where machine learning people tried to use the Netflix database to make good recommendations for people. No one understands how those uh, advice systems work, right? Now you may say that they're not very good. Yeah, I agree, they're not very good. Like Amazon too, like why are they recommending, you know, so uh, you buy a lamp and they're like, would you like another lamp? <laughs> it's like, no, I actually one's enough today, thank you. <laughs> but, uh, but that aside, nobody understands how those systems work. They're just big engines that may spit out predictions. Uh, uh, you, that works. You can make good predictions without understanding anything about the system. In the basic sciences, we usually want to understand the system because we intend to intervene. Um, and that's a distinction. Nevertheless, uh, these tools are very useful. Uh, their companions to causal inference. They're just not the same thing. Okay, let me give you an introduction. I think I can, I can uh, uh, excite you about this topic for your return on Friday. So think about a contest between different models. Uh, these models include different um, structures and combinations of parameters and, and uh, variables as a race between horses. Uh, each, mo each horse is a model. And in any given race, that is any given sample, one horse will win, will do the best, will fit it the best. Um, and the distance between the horses gives us some information about the relative performance of these horses on average across tracks. You want to make a bet on the next race, not this race, right? You just lost money on this race. Okay, I'm sorry. But now how are you going to bet on the next one? And the quantitative differences in the finishing times are information that you want to use. And this is something where all we've got uh, to, to predict the next race is the performance on the current race or the past races. And this is, it's a paucity of information, but it's what we've got. But you imagine that the finishing times won't be exactly the same on the next race. Uh, so what can you do with this? What you should not do is merely always choose the horse that runs the fastest, right? Uh, uh, moving past the horses for a second. <laughs> uh, there's this basic problem with parameters is that if you add a parameter to a model, it will fit better. It'll fit the sample better. There's an asterisk at the bottom, which is incredibly important, that will come to later in the course. But for all the models you've seen so far in this course, every time you add a parameter, the model will fit better. Guaranteed. And so you cannot use fit to sample as a measure of anything useful. All it does is tell you how many parameters your model has. That's all it does. Um, and the basic problem here is there are two things going on. Uh, the, our two monsters. Uh, one is underfitting. Models that are too simple don't learn enough from the data. Models that are, uh, then there's overfitting. Models that are too complicated have a bunch of predictor variables that don't actually matter and extra parameters. They learn too much from the data. They essentially encrypt the sample with increasing accuracy. Until you, if you have one parameter for every data point, you can completely encode your data set. It'll be encrypted in a different coding scheme and it can spit it back out as predictions exactly. Right? It's just an encryption scheme. Uh, that is not what you want. But in the limit, you could do that. You could have a parameter for every data point, and then you're gold. Yeah. But it'll make terrible predictions, and that's what I want to show you. Uh, so what we say is there's this goal to learn the regular features of the sample. Those are the, the regular features are the features that will generalize to other samples coming from the same process. And this is the struggle, is to figure out what those regular features are. So you can't just use the most complex model because it will tend to choose irregular features of the sample as well. The asterisk at the bottom is that in multi-level models, it, they do not behave this way. You can add parameters to a multi-level model and it will reduce overfitting. And in fact, that's why we use multi-level models. They're more complicated, but they're less likely to overfit. And that's why I always use them. So some of you know, I have this project that I finished that has 27,000 parameters, uh, and it overfits very little because of that, right? So all of this hierarchical structure that reduces overfitting. Okay, what's the problem with parameters? Let me give you a toy data set. It's real data, but this is a toy example to help you understand. Um, again, I'm, I'm an anthropologist, so the examples are gonna get boring to you if you're not an anthropologist, but, or maybe they're exciting. Uh, humans evolved once, right? And we're trying to figure out how that happens. <laughs> and uh, uh, one of the things that's interesting about humans is that we have big brains. And so if we look at body mass against brain volume for humans and other extinct bipedal apes, uh, the hominins, uh, there's this scatter plot here for just a 
uh, curated example uh, of uh, specimens. Afarensis africanus in the lower left, and Habilis and Boisei, Rudolfensis ergaster, and then ourselves sapiens at the top. Uh, there is some association between body mass and brain volume. Bigger species tend to have bigger brains, but we're a real outlier on this. What's the statistical relationship? If you wanted to fit a model to this, what would you do? Um, and how would you decide if, if the model is good or not? The most common and abused measure of uh, how good a model is, how much variance is explained, is this thing called variance explained, R squared. R squared in a linear regression is just the uh, uh, relative difference between the variance in the outcomes minus the variance in the residuals, or one minus the ratio of the variance in the residuals to the variance in the outcomes. What's the variance in the residuals? Remember the residuals are those leftover line segments after you make your prediction to the, to the uh, there's the model's expectation and there's the actual data point. That distance is a residual. What's the variance in residuals? That's the amount of noise still to be explained. And then there's the amount that you had originally. That's the variance in the outcome. So if there's no variance in the residuals, R squared is one, which means you explained it all. <laughs> Congratulations, give yourself a hand, right? Uh, and what I wanna show you is you can always get to R squared equals one. It's a trivial, uh, first I'm gonna show you how to do it, and then you can be famous, right? Um, I mean, th this is a bit of a joke, but I've seen nature papers where people have display regressions with R squared equals one in a graph in a nature paper. So uh, there's a lot of statistical naivete out there, even in the best journals. Okay, so let's start with something simple. Simple linear regression. Actually, I don't think this is a bad model. <laughs> this is the place I would start. I mean, I can do a little better because there's gonna be allometric scaling here. We've talked about that. Actually, solutions to, to uh, the second week are up and I talk about allometric scaling in the solution to one of those. So hopefully you'll find it fun. I imagine, I, I assert that people are cylinders. And then you can figure out a lot about the relationship between weight and height from that fact, <laughs> just from the equation of a volume of a cylinder. Okay, so uh, uh, linear regression here isn't bad. This is yield linear regression between body mass and brain volume. R squared is 0.5. We've already got half the variation in the data. Just with a straight line. That's really good. There's something going on here, right? But why stop there? I, I showed you how to use parabolas. Now you're drunk on power, right? <laughs> and so you uh, turn down the lights and cackle and, and fire up the parabola. And what you get from this is even better. You've gained a few extra percent of R squared now. Um, you see it curves down. Now it leaves us out, but it works better for the others because it does curve down. The trend does curve down for the non-human species uh, at the end. Yeah, you with me so far? But there's no reason to stop at a parabola. There's nothing special about parabolas. We can go all the way to a sixth order polynomial here. And then we run out of data points. Uh, let me show you what happens as we progressively march through higher order polynomials. Here are the two I just showed you, the linear and uh, first order, second order, right? We go from uh, R squared 0.51 to 0.54, put in a cubic. Uh, cubic uh, polynomials can turn twice, good times. This is even better, now we're up to 0.7, right, 0.69, this is pretty good. We got a big jump here when we put in the cubic. Probably it's cubic, brain evolution is cubic. I mean, you get heavy enough, your brain collapses. Right? That's exactly what happens. <laughs> and uh, uh, what about the fourth order polynomial? This can turn three times. Uh, now we're up to 0.82, this is even better. Wow, actually you get heavy enough, it's gonna skyrocket. We should all try to get heavier. <laughs> right? This will make us all have bigger brains. Uh, obviously this is absurd, right? This is an exercise in absurdity. Um, we go up to the fifth order polynomial. This is getting really good now. Uh, now we're up to R squared, 0.99. Uh, we've almost passed through every point exactly here. Yeah, almost. There's just one little point down there you see that's just off the curve in the end. And then finally, we reach nirvana, the singularity. <laughs> um, all variance has been explained because we have a parameter for every data point. R squared is one. You can publish this in nature. Right? No, of course you can't. This is absurd. And I show you the uh, zero line here to show you that uh, there's nothing stopping this thing from presenting, predicting negative brain volumes, right? Uh, clearly you wouldn't accept this. But if all you do is choose models based upon R squared, this is the trap you're walking into. It's obvious here because you know what the data mean and you would never do this in this case. That's why I use it as a lesson. But in a bigger data set, you can't look at the data this easily. In a multiple regression, it's not gonna be obvious what's going on. And the same hazard exists. This is the problem with parameters. This is the monster Scylla. Uh, uh, you're walking into its jaws here. Um, 
So let's think about underfitting and overfitting in a principled way now. What does underfitting mean? I'm going to use it to mean that the model is insensitive to the details of the sample. It's overly insensitive. That's why it's underfit. <coughs> so let's take the linear regression, for example. We can repeat the linear regression, deleting one species at a time, and draw a bunch of regression lines on the graph. And that's what I've done here. I give you the code to do this in the text. This is easy to do. Um, and so uh, we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven species. We can get seven regression lines, one uh, leaving each one out, right? And then fitting on the other six and draw a bunch of lines. You see the lines don't move very much. There is a line that deviates a lot when we drop homo sapiens. That's the line at the bottom. Right? When you drop homo sapiens, you get a big drop. But the other ones don't make much difference. This model is very insensitive to the sample. Yeah? That's underfitting. Well, we don't know if this is underfit, actually, but this is, this is how underfit models behave. They don't care about the details of the, of the sample because they're not learning much from it. Maybe too little. Overfitting is the opposite. This is when the model is incredibly sensitive to arbitrary details of the sample as like this fifth order polynomial. I think this is the fifth order uh, polynomial or the sixth order. If you delete any one point, the whole curve just flies out of control uh, all over the place. Because this is how poly this is why I, I tried to urge you not to use polynomial regressions back in chapter four is because the whole curve moves whenever any parameter changes and it just flies all over the place and they're very hard to control. Um, so this is a, a classic kind of overfit model. And what you want uh, are regular models. You want the regular features of the sample. How do you achieve that? Uh, so given we don't have crystal balls. Um, there are multiple strategies and you can use them all together. Uh, the first thing is some sort of regularization procedure. And in Bayesian statistics, one way to do that is through the prior. Prior distributions, those, those prior predictive simulations I was forcing you to do earlier, they regularize inference because they're skeptical of impossible relationships. Yeah? So they, 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 they create regularizing force on your inferences. You can be even more aggressive than those. Uh, and get more regularization. And I'm going to show you with some simulations how this works. Um, in the non-Bayesian approach, you'll, you'll see things called penalized likelihood, which is mathematically identical in the models you've been using so far to using a prior. Yeah. But machine learning people use those all the time. Scientists seem to have some problem with, with doing this, but it, it, why do machine learning people use it? Because it makes better predictions when you regularize. And that's why they always regularize. Uh, Cross-validation is what I just showed you. Cross-validation is a case where you drop observations, you fit on the remaining ones, and then you predict on the ones you left out. So you're testing the model's ability not to fit things, but to actually predict things from the same process. And I'm going to show you how to do that as well. Cross-validation doesn't solve, doesn't induce regularization, but it tells you if a model is overfitting. It lets you compare models on a, on a performance measure that matters. Right? Fit to sample isn't what matters. It's fit to the future. Right? So you don't have the future, so you fake it. You leave out some data and you treat that like the future. Yeah. It's not perfect, but it's certainly better than using R squared. Um, information criteria is, is a theoretically based approach that measures the cross-validation performance, uh, to speak crudely. It, it, it is a way to use information theory to say, in theory, what the predictive accuracy of a model will be out of sample. And it works. it's amazing that it works as well as it does. And I'll show you how that's developed. These are things like the uh, Akaike information criterion. Uh, then finally, science. That's the good part. There's lots of science involved here. You need iterative learning in groups. That's science. Um, okay, I've got one minute. Uh, so let me get to a point where I can, I can set up something exciting. All right, so the road we're going to journey now, uh, when you come back on Friday, is we want to get to cross-validation and an information criterion called WAIC, the widely applicable information criterion, which has replaced AIC. Uh, AIC is, is, is a hero of a past war and should be buried with honors, but it is completely replaced by WAIC now. And um, uh, the journey to these uh, approaches requires some setups because I want you to understand why we're making the choices that we do. And I'm going to give this to you in a fairly heuristic fashion. There's a lot more detail in the chapter. Uh, the first thing we have to answer is how we're going to measure accuracy. And this is not a small problem. There are lots of bad ways to measure the accuracy of a model like receiver operating characteristics uh, and things that you should not use. There is a actual gold standard for measuring the accuracy of predictions. And I want to motivate that for you first, because that's what we want to develop with. Um, 
And then once we've got it, we have to measure distance to the target. That is, we've got a model. It's an approximation of some true process that we don't know. If we've got multiple models and they're all approximating it, how do we decide how close they're getting? And this is not a trivial question, actually. And I'm going to show you there's, again, a principled way to answer this question that comes from information theory. Um, and then we actually need a practical way to estimate that distance once we've decided in principle what we should be estimating. And I'll show you how to do that as well. Um, and then um, uh, I want to show you how to develop uh, these instruments like cross-validation and WAIC. So with that, I'm going to put up this slide and say on Friday I'll resume right here with a crash course in information theory. You'll love it. All right, thank you for your attention, and I'll see you on Friday.